sitting in the back. Um, do you want to introduce the panel quickly, the speaker? No. I'll read my whole prepared remarks. What are you going to say? What's on the paper? Okay. Here. All right, this is what I <laughs> have on my paper. The title of Aaron Wolf's presentation is Where's My <laughs> Jetpack? And I think I pronounced that correctly. Uh, the world they promised us and the world that we want to create. All right, some details about this session, which should be familiar to you by now. Uh, Aaron will have about 40 minutes for his presentation, and then there will be another 35 minutes for questions and answers. If you think of a question during the session, write it down in your little white card, and I think Promise is our question taker for this session. Raise your hand, Promise will come to you and get your question, and it will be sent to the front. And here to introduce Aaron is Omi's own Abby Chu. Thank you. Oh, that was stressful, but now I'm just gonna, gonna talk about my friends, so that'll be, that'll be easy. Uh, in the early spring of 2004, I was a graduate student in Iowa City. It had been a bitterly cold and windy winter, as Iowa winters tend to be, we were hip deep in snow for weeks. And that was the spring I met Aaron Wolf. And if I remember correctly, Aaron, you can tell me if I'm wrong. We made risotto at your house on Governor Street. And I had never made risotto. I learned how that night. And that's the thing about Aaron. When you hang out with him for very long, you find yourself doing things you didn't think you could, or thought you were too old to do gracefully, or didn't think you had time to do at all. Some of those things are dangerous. <laughs> I, for example, found myself on the back of his motorcycle, on the interstate, at dusk, without headlights, after having been stung by a bee as we drove past an apiary, and I am allergic to bees. <laughs> Later, I found myself clutching a boom microphone, which is the big microphone on the end of the pole, balancing on the back of a moving forklift, wearing headphones that were tied to the camera Aaron had on his shoulder as he perched on the side of that forklift as we sped through a giant refrigerated food warehouse in Connecticut. <laughs> That's true. But I also learned how to make a leg of lamb on a rotisserie powered by a single D battery. Or C battery, I can never remember and how to drive down Broadway in Manhattan at rush hour. The cool thing about Aaron Wolf, one of the reasons we wanted him to come and talk to us about what we might do next, is one, that he's not afraid to have new ideas, but also he's not afraid to forge ahead. This is my friend, and he's made eight full-length documentary films on topics from human trafficking to America's broken food system to Cuba to baseball. He and his sister have built a cabin in the Adirondacks. Aaron opened a local foods grocery store and cafe in Brooklyn. He's won a Peabody Award, as well as awards and grants from the Kellogg Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Paul Newman Foundation, and ITVS. He lived and worked in Peru for two years. He lived in Mexico. His films have been shown and won awards on at least five different continents. He's trying to figure out how to use commuter trains to bring food into New York City at night. And in the living room of that house on Governor Street in Iowa, he taught me to waltz. In the backyard, I learned to put some wicked spin on a wiffle ball by watching him pitch inning after inning on the diamond we mowed into the grass in the backyard. I like to talk with Aaron because he's not only an idea man. I like to hang out with him other reasons. One is, he's a good cook. But I also like to hang out with Aaron because he's willing to start, to begin. I'm excited to find out what he can teach us to see in all the possible futures of Olney Friends School. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to introduce to a talented filmmaker, a visionary, and my friend, Aaron Wolf. Well, that was the best introduction that anyone has ever given me. 
Uh, somebody asked me this morning if I was, ever got nervous before I spoke, and I said I only get nervous when I'm speaking in front of people and institutions I care about. Um, if that's the case... I don't think this thing is going to stay up. I already was about to admit how nervous I was, and now I'm twice that. But I'm incredibly grateful for you guys having me. I'm incredibly honored to be here. Um, just to walk around this campus at harvest time and to be among so many thoughtful people, and most to be asked to speak in a community that I know places great value on gathering in silence is a great, great honor. The project to hand to bring a number of only insiders and outsiders to contemplate the future of an institution is a really awesome opportunity. But when I ask myself what it is that I might bring to this occasion, this collective exercise of coming together to think about the future, I realized why Abby and why the rest of you might have asked me. You see, I was actually born in the future. <laughs> Despite the apparent chronological anomaly, the decade of my birth, 1960s, was actually the future as clearly evidenced by this stuff. How else do you explain this? <laughs> Here's something in the 1960s that the US military came up with in order to carry eggs. It also worked very well for carrying human beings. But by far, the most intriguing transportation development for me as a kid was another mode that seemed destined to be the way I would spend my entire adult life traveling around. The jetpack. I thought Abby was going to slip in a picture of a forklift in a uh, packing warehouse. But it's true that I was obsessed with jetpacks. And I think partly that was because my teacher, Mr. Buckheit, promised me. He promised me that in the future this would be the case. He said two memorable things. Mr. Buckheit, I remember it was in the hallway. It would have been around 1968. He came up to me and he said, you know, son, there's two things that are going to happen in the future, so you better get ready. One was, and he said, I also remember this, he said that these things were going to come true in 1985, which was a year that seemed impossibly in the future to me. He said, by 1985, we're going to be measuring everything with something called the metric system. <laughs> and I said, what's that? He said, well, you better start learning it, because you're going to need it. The other thing he told me is that to transport ourselves across all those endless kilometers, we would be flying around on rocket-propelled jetpacks. So all you teachers out there, be very careful what you promise. But I was convinced, and why shouldn't I be? Our history certainly was taught to me as if it were an arc that were conflated with the history of technological progress, one in which things continually get better. Jetpacks were obviously consistent with this vision. So I drew crayon pictures of people with little flames coming out of their backs, I tried to stay up late and watch reruns of the movie Thunderball, which opens with James Bond doing this incredible jetpack thing, or seeming to. And I spent endless afternoons trying to replicate what I imagined jetpacks would do to me in the future with my Schwinn Stingray bicycle. <laughs> One day, we gathered around the television to watch human beings step on the moon. And next, it seems, we would see those same astronauts out in outer space using an absolutely mind-blowing version of the outer space jetpack. This idea that we were progressing, which for me meant doing things that were continually more awesome, seemed inarguably affirmed. But I was not so unique in 1969 in being obsessed with all things astronaut. In our kindergarten, we went around the classroom and we did a little poll and I remember, just like they probably still do today, they asked all of us what we wanted to be when we grew up. And about 80% of us said, astronaut. I mean, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> but I felt that I was somehow more into it than everybody else. I wanted to know what they wore, what they did up there, and especially what they ate. NASA, too, was vexed by problems of nutrition in space and poured money into the invention of new foodstuffs for a new age. Inexplicably, and this is just a little aside about my parents, 
At the same time as I was getting excited about these new food steps, my parents were going in the opposite direction, seemingly to me the opposite direction of human progress, and getting into Whole Foods and the nascent organic farmers markets in Baltimore. Obviously, my loyalty was with the space program. <laughs> Astronauts had not only to worry about getting enough nutrients, but issues of eating in zero gravity. You could not be eating organic brown rice or granola on the lunar lander. <laughs> Crumbs might fly around and get in behind the consoles, and Lord knows what might happen next. Fortunately, America had a solution. In 1970, Pillsbury Foods, collaborating with NASA, filed for a trademark for a non-frozen balanced energy snack in rod form containing nutritionally balanced amounts of carbohydrate, fat, and protein. Even better, they decided to market these things to children as well as to astronauts. I was thrilled. Tang was my beverage of choice, and space food, which was usually placed conveniently near the checkout counters at just about kid eye height, uh, was about all I wanted to eat. And my parents groaned, but even in their macrobiotic frenzy, they acquiesced on occasion. Never too early to start training for a career in space. I love that picture. <laughs> space food tasted like, well, it tasted like whatever flavors they had put into them. Chocolate, peanut butter, chicken. I loved it. It was almost like the creators from Pillsbury had seen all those early 1960s Star Trek episodes in which the ship's hold carried a kind of amorphous goo that could be transformed into any number of foodstuffs simply by adding chemically enhanced flavors and textures. You would put a quantity of goo in the machine and you would ask for your chosen dinner and presto. Space food sticks made me feel like this appealing future was within reach. And luckily for me, there were at the same time plans afoot to transform our entire national food system into one that increasingly prioritized the massive production of a kind of 20th century goo. That goo was called yellow dent field corn. And just like the goo on Star Trek, and just like the goo on the, star, on the, star, on the Starship Enterprise, this stuff could be transmutated into thousands of processed foods. In 1973, while NASA was wrapping up the, spa uh, the space program to include something called Space Lab, down there, our Earthling Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Butts, was recasting farm legislation. And the provisions he helped pass into law ensured that the nation began pouring billions of dollars in subsidies to incentivize and maximize goo production. If I had been aware of this at the time, in 1973, I'm sure I would have approved. But maybe it was this, my early interest in space goo, that planted a seed because 30 years later, I made a film, which some of you may have seen, some of you may have seen last night, that addressed some of these issues. And here's the <laughs> that will 